Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. We have Jeremy Weiss here of Rise25, Rise who has done thousands of interviews of top healthcare experts. And we flipped the script, and he's going to be in me. Get started. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Dr. Art Mullen, who is a great guest. Uh, you'll be getting his, his podcast will be out by now. You can go look at the list and listen to it. It's a great podcast about longevity. It's really interesting. And he was an awesome guest. I want to thank him for being on the podcast. I look forward to listening to that one, Dr. Sims. Yeah, you know, longevity. I think about that a lot because it's really about long term health and how do we stay healthy for a longer period of time. But um, before we talk about today's topic, and we're going to be talking about a specific procedure and explaining it because you get a lot of questions around this procedure. And frankly, you know, people should know about it if they're, you know, if they're having specific types of hearing loss or other issues. So before we get into that, this episode is brought to you by the Arizona Hearing Center. Uh, You know, what Dr. Sims does, he helps patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can connect better with their family and friends. And, you know, Dr. Sims, you say this all the time. It's not about your hearing. It's about being independent, right? And um, the reason I know you're so passionate about helping patients is because you lost your brother, Ravi, twice. And people could listen to that full episode of what I'm referring to. But um, he lost from radiation from his brain tumor. And then again, when he passed away, and you are the ears in ENT. You've performed over 10,000 ear surgeries over the past 20 years. So you can check out uh, the Arizona Hearing Center, azhear.com. He also authored a book, Listen Up. So you go to listenuphearing.com. The the topic is the sexiest topic I could think about, which is cochlear implants. Okay. And first of all, we'll we'll talk about, are you a candidate? How do you know if you need one? Uh, But first, just talk about what is a cochlear implant? So Jeremy, uh, good, good to see you. So the big thing is, is um, it as you lose your hearing, you can lose two things. You can lose your ability to perceive based on volume, and you can also lose your ability to have clarity. Now, sometimes people lose clarity because they get a high tone hearing loss and they can't hear the consonants, which are the parts of words that give them meaning. And so for those people, there are what we would call traditional hearing aids will give you those consonants back and then your clarity is restored. But in some people, no matter how loud we make it, they still don't get clarity. And so that hearing loss comes from degeneration of the nerve endings inside of your hearing organ. Those are called hair cells because when we look at them under a microscope, they look like a hair, right? And so... In some people, when they degenerate, no matter how loud we make it, they still don't understand. And so those are the people who we talk about a cochlear implant. The reason is, is a hearing aid makes things louder, drives the eardrum harder, drives the three bones of hearing harder, and presents it to the hearing organ louder to then go through those receptor cells. If those receptor cells or hair cells are so broken that no matter how loud you make it, you can't get understanding, the hearing aid's not going to work for you. So what a cochlear implant does is it puts a bunch of little wires inside of the hearing organ and it directly stimulates those hearing nerves beyond the broken receptor cells. And so you bypass the broken part of the system rather than a hearing aid that tries to drive through it. And when you do that, you can restore both clarity and loudness with the device. So really it's people who have hearing technology but still don't have understanding. That's basically who we're targeting the uh, cochlear implant. And most people think, oh, I have hearing loss, I need to get a hearing aid. They don't even realize, oh, I can get this thing called a cochlear implant. Is that- Hearing is poor enough, yes. And so one of the things we will do is maybe, you know, we're not a hammer and everything's a nail. We want to get the technology that fits you best. So if the preliminary uh, hearing uh, examination indicates it, we'll go ahead and do the further testing to determine if you're a cochlear implant candidate. Got it. Um, I'm wondering, we'll talk about some cases 
and some maybe good candidates for the case and maybe bad candidates for this type of technology. But what are some myths around cochlear implants or objections you get from, from patients? I think the biggest objection, frankly, and it is realistic, but I'm not sure it's a big objection, is the surgery that you actually have to get surgery. So people really get worked up about that. And I kind of understand it. Um, the surgery itself is 45 minutes to an hour. It's outpatient surgery. You come in and out that day, the pain is controlled with ibuprofen. And so, which is just Motrin or Advil. What I would say is, is yes, there's a procedure and yes, you have to be healthy enough, but the gains of what this technology does is amazing and worth it. So, you know, one of the things is, is when cochlear implants um, first started, you know, every one of them was a miracle. And now what I say is it's a miraculous technology that's no longer a miracle because it happens often. And so the people you talk to who say, what would you say to somebody who's afraid of getting a surgery? They say, you're crazy, go get it. You can hear better, you'll reconnect, you'll be able to hear, you'll be more social, your spouse won't have to translate for you. You can have conversation, it brings your life back. And you know who else's life it brings back? Your spouse, because they're the ones who are answering the phone, ordering at the restaurant, you know, answering the door, translating for you, liaising with your family, all of those things that the hearing loss causes is a problem. Yeah. I mean, the I also want someone who's done ten thousand tens of thousands of these. You know, I've done tens of thousands of years. Right. Yeah. Of, yeah. Any hundred <laughs> cochlear implants. Yes. Um So are there any other objections that people have besides surgery and it's an outpatient procedure? Um, Are people usually satisfied with that? Well, yeah. I mean, what I would say is, is, is the, I don't know if it's an objection, but the biggest um, concern thing that we have, and we spend a lot of time in our cochlear implant center is making sure that patients have appropriate expectations. And so making sure that the technology can do for them what they expect it to do and that they have realistic expectations. And so a good part of, so when a patient is diagnosed or evaluated and found to be from a hearing point of view, a candidate, we spend the next couple of months educating them and counseling them and getting them up to speed to really understand what the cochlear implant can and can't do for you. So one of the objections people will say is, well, I don't want a cochlear implant. And what I always say is, is, is when they come in and they say, I don't want a cochlear implant, I always say, you don't know enough to know you want one and you don't know enough to say you don't want one. And so we spend, we have a, a, an online course where we help people and we will talk to them and take them through a process where we educate them about the cochlear implant so they can come to a well-educated, well-informed decision. Like, is this what I want to do? Is this the, what I, I should be pursuing? Do they come in saying that, like they've researched it on their own, or is this after you've talked to them a little bit? Some have, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, one of the things about hearing loss is sometimes it's the patient that's coming to the table, but oftentimes it's a family member, a spouse or a child bringing an elder parent in. So they're the, you know, I always say, you know, even with other surgeries, it's amazing. Like I'll say, so I need you surgery. And then somebody's spouse will say, yeah, I think we could get surgery. And I always go, it's very easy for a spouse to consent <laughs> for the surgery. Obviously the patient has come to the table. So they have, you know, I mean, I think saying, I don't want a cochlear implant really speaks of the mystery, right? There's a lot of things people don't want when they don't understand it and don't know about it. So our particular process really is we are educational heavy. We want people to understand what they're getting themselves into. So let's walk through a good candidate and bad candidate. So let's start with a not good candidate. We'll call well, him John, for instance. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, John, uh, one of the things, so what I will tell you is, is the patients we see um, that are, there are probably two characteristics of a, a, a not ideal cochlear implant candidate. One is uh, somebody who doesn't actually want to go through the process to understand what they're getting themselves into. And so the analogy I kind of used is like getting married, right? Like, so that's somebody who wants to meet somebody and get married the next day. And, and for some people that works out, but 
typically that's not a good indicator of a successful marriage, right? And so you want to get to know your significant other better and get engaged and go through that whole process so you know what you're getting yourself into. And so if John, that candidate, is not willing to go through that process, that's a problem in itself. The other thing becomes if John has unrealistic expectations. And then the third and probably the most common is we have a lot of people who come in and say, I want to get a cochlear implant. And so the underlying question is why? And so the reason is they don't hear well. And so what we do is what I call deconstruct their hearing. We want to see, you know, your hearing when you have, when you're hearing impaired, your hearing is the sound that you're being presented, your hearing technology in a hearing aid, that whole process, and then your ear and then your brain. Well, believe it or not, the most common problem is people don't have hearing aids that are working right. So one of the reasons John is not a good candidate is because his hearing, his Functional hearing is bad, but his hearing is good enough that he doesn't qualify. So his problem is not that he's not a cochlear implant candidate. His problem is, frankly, he's got poor hearing aids that don't do the right work. And so one of the things we do as our process is we analyze people's hearing aids themselves to see. That's why one of the, the tests that we do to determine if you're a cochlear implant candidate is this. We take our own hearing aids and program them appropriately to your hearing loss. Why? Because two out of three hearing aids walking in the door are not. Then we test your two ears together. We don't test each ear singularly because when you function, you function with your two ears together and you actually do better with your two ears together than you do with each ear. Then we put you in some background noise and then we read you a list of words and we determine whether or not you can understand. And so some people come in doing terribly. We put our hearing aids in and they do well. So then we've actually located the problem is not your ears, it's your technology. And so we are deconstructing their hearing experience. So John's not a bad guy. He's just not a good cochlear implant candidate. And now the good candidate, we'll call her Jane. So Jane is the exact, so getting back to that testing, you put the hearing aids in, you put a little bit of background noise and you read her a list of words and she does not get, she gets less than 40% of those words right. So even in an ideal hearing aid in, uh, rehabilitation, she does not have good understanding. She's also somebody who wants to take ownership of the process herself and learn about it, figure out whether or not it's what it's gonna do, what the aftercare involves. In other words, what her investment is in terms of getting to learn to hear. So. The cochlear implant will present the information to your brain, and then you have to learn how to reprocess that information. So there is an investment on a patient's part and an understanding of that beforehand. So I always tell people like, look, this isn't like, you know, you put the newest version of Windows in your brain and it boots up and it runs. I mean, you, there is a rehabilitative process and you have to buy in on that. If you're going to get a cochlear implant and sit at home by yourself and not talk to anybody and not listen to anything, you're never going to get better at it. Yeah. Yeah. Ta I love how you say it, deconstructing hearing loss because you're really separating out the pieces so you can properly diagnose what the actual issue is as opposed to just a one size fits all. Oh, you have hearing loss. You should get a hearing aid. Right. And so that's one of our big differences, right, is we can give you whatever you we, we figure out what you need, not what we have because we mm -hmm. have everything. So it's a lot easier when you have everything. You know, Mark, I want to um, um, let's see here. Uh, I want to point people, I have one last question, but I want to point people towards your website, uh, azhear.com and check it out and check out listenuphearing.com. Last question, Dr. Sims is, is there anything else that we did not talk about um, that we should mention about cochlear implants or the procedure itself? Um, you know, I mean, what I would say is, is, is um, you want to be at a place, you want to get your hearing care at a place that that's an option for you. And it's really, you know, so the way I look at it is, hey, you're going to learn about your hearing and you're going to learn how you're going to hear better. Um, if you or somebody who's taking care of you from a hearing point of view mentions it, I think you should learn more about it. There's a lot online. Uh, actually, there's a chapter in the book, Listen Up, about cochlear implants as an alternative technology. And so, you know, fundamentally, we want people to reconnect to maintain their independence, have great vibrant social relationships, have less frustration with their family. And so for many people, a cochlear implant or somebody you know 
might be a cochlear. So you don't know if you don't learn more about it. And so what I would tell you people is there's very little downside about having a conversation and getting more information. So it doesn't mean you're committing to surgery. So, you know, I always tell people just because you're learning about a cochlear implant, this isn't like a car, like you drive it off the lot and it's yours, or you have a closing date on your house. I mean, you get a time of due diligence. And that's actually why I use the marriage analogy. Cause you know, when you get engaged, then you get to know your, your significant other better. And like for uh, cochlear implants, your wedding day is the surgery day. And then afterwards is living with your spouse, which is the rehabilitative part that's really matters. And so one of the things I say to patients is, and the surgery day is like your wedding day. It's a day you make a lot of big deal about, but you don't really remember very much. And because it's, it's, a, it's a day, not, not a lifetime. And so this is really about that after part, that being married to a cochlear implant and having a great relationship and really hearing better and functioning better. Love it. Everyone check out azhear.com, listenuphearing.com. Thanks, Dr. Sims. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.